speak. The interviews of Robert Dumb, 1959 to 2008. Our speaker, Jean Poole Ward, is Wald. the Wald, sorry, I've got to really need to be wearing my glasses. Um, is the music specialist and research librarian at Stetson University in the land, Florida. From 1999 until 2011, she was the director of the Jenkins Music Library until that collection was absorbed into the DuPont Ball Library at Stetson. Her current position includes music cataloging, collection development, general reference and music reference, technical services student supervision, library instruction for music classes, and editing the School of Music programs. She studied musicology in the doctoral program at Indiana University received her MLS from IU, the MM in Music History and Literature from Butler University, and the BME in Vocal Music Education from West Virginia University. She has served in both law and engineering libraries in the corporate world, as well as various academic library positions, general cataloger, scores cataloger, cataloging reference librarian, and music librarian. She has also held church music positions as organist and choir director, has taught piano, and sometimes plays the recorder when she can find bullying accomplices. I understand. Okay, first of all, I'll try to talk really fast, but um, thank you for having an alien in your chapter. Uh, I'm an active member of SEMLA, and I have to say, this group is certainly as jolly and friendly as SEMLA, in spite of its... Um, you know, opinion of itself because we're spread all over the South and it's very hard. Uh, I do a lot of traveling when I have to go to those. So last year I skipped Semla because it was in New Orleans during hurricane season. I already have hurricanes at my house, which took down the cedar tree. Thank you, no. Um, now, um, this collection, uh, I wanted to start by showing you, is this reading off the flash drive now? Would I be yeah. able to bring up the Excel file, you think? I better not try. I, I, I could do it at the end. Yeah. yeah, I wanted to show you just how large the, the whole thing is, but uh, you can see the numbers on the little handouts I've given you. It's hundreds and hundreds of interviews. Um, first of all, let me explain in context um, at Stetson. Stetson is a very small liberal arts school, uh, about 30 minutes from the ocean, and has a very fine school of music. It has about 200 music majors. When I first came, I've been there 19 years, when I first came, there were 2,000 students at the Deland campus. Um, there's also a law school in Tampa, but that, we don't talk to them. So, uh, the, the, um, it was great because I was in the music building, in the music library, I did everything. I had a full-time assistant, a half-time assistant. It was great. Uh, that lasted a few years. Um, Sorry, I saw a red light. I thought I was being pulled over or something. <laughs> okay, um, this is a crazy day. Um, where was I going with this? Oh yes, now, uh, so being a little one horse operation, I'm sure a bunch of you either work in places like that or have worked in jobs where you're it. So you have to do everything, uh, everything but sleeping usually. Um, and it means that you're spread so thin, it's very hard to get a lot of big stuff done. I hear laughter. Somebody in a room back there. <laughs> so, it, in context, this is it. Kind of amazes me looking back that I've even been able to get this collection and even been able to work with it given the context. Now, in 2011, uh, it was decided. Well, let me back up. The, the recession and a few other things in our budget uh, caused us to cut back on the music library hours. Uh, we stopped being open a lot. We went to a 10 to 6 schedule. My assistant lost her job. My weekend person had to go. It was uh, So that made it a lot more compact and difficult. Um, I had up to 21 student assistants because I also managed the math lab, which was no fun. So, uh, you know, cataloging, um, reference, collection development. I also edit all of the School of Music programs, which is a big time suck that my boss doesn't understand. She says, that's proofreading. Well, it's research most of the time. <laughs> You know, all you need is one wrong opus number, one different spelling to have to go hunt for that. So my time is so split up. This has been a very difficult uh, collection. Now, first of all, who is Robert Dumb? Has anybody heard of him before? In what context? Uh, I'm the librarian and archivist at Dawson Conservatory. 
Ah, <laughs> so maybe you're, I got a letter from someone, some years ago I contacted someone there to verify that he really had been the dean because as long, I knew him for about six years. The, the issues of working with a living donor who's hovering nearby are interesting. <laughs> <laughs> he was a lovely man, but he, um, I think every conversation we ever had, and that's probably a hundred conversations, I think he mentioned that deanship every single time. <laughs> and at first I was so suspicious because he was one of these flowery purple pros. I'll try to read you a little bit of that. Guys, so enthusiastic, so effervescent. I thought, yeah, really? I, I actually didn't believe him. Uh, so I researched it and got a very nice confirmation from someone at Boston Conservatory. And yeah. when I drove in yesterday in the taxi, the first thing I saw was Fenway, and the second thing I saw was Boston Conservatory. So that kind of made me feel like that was the right thing. His collection started here, really. Um, he did a lot of uh, interviewing of people who visited. Uh, there's, a, there's a long list, and, and he's written several memoir-ish things in the collection, and he mentions long lists of people he talked to. Um, sticky note to the rescue. Um, he said, origin, uh, he saw, uh, in, oh, I'm sorry, wrong page, wrong rescue. Uh, the reason he, he was absolutely in love with Boston, he talked about it the day he died. Um, and this is quoting from his memoir that he wrote that's in the collection. I think part of it may have been published somewhere, um, but it's got lots of inserts and unfinished items. Uh, it's called Lessons That Lasted the View from 70. Boston was a ball. Sure, there were problems, money a big one, but larger loomed the human problems of hiring and letting go before pension plans were dated earth. Oh, <laughs> Boston felt like home. Um, this was the place I had projected in my desire to know the artists I already knew by name and product. I didn't have long to wait. The conservatory staff included composers Alan Hovannis, Daniel Pinkham, and Nicholas Leninsky, and the last two he did interview. And the major instrumental conductors were all Boston Symphony players. Musicians were always coming to town. In my second year, the Christian Science Monitor asked me to write reviews and Boston Music Company asked me to edit. That led to the interviews. And that's the only statement I found where he actually talks about what led specifically to the interviews. And I don't remember him ever really telling me this um, exactly. Okay, okay, that's kind of squished. Um, Robert, uh, I just wanted to show you the kind of the his life a little bit. He, um, he loved children. He was married to a woman named Mary who was a musician, pianist, uh, theory teacher. They had two children. They were married for I think 28 or 29 years. Um, after they divorced, he um, acquired a male partner whom he was with for about 30 years and who I knew very, very well because he outlived Robert. Um, I don't know what has become of the children and that's a kind of a sticky subject that I don't know if you've written biography and I've been looking into it. I was at a conference a couple of years ago and was offered a book contract on this collection, one chapter being his life and the other chapter about the collection. I decided not to go with it because the publisher had sued a librarian uh, for, I guess, libel for calling it a vanity press. So I'm not gonna say who the publisher is. It's in all of our libraries and his picture was on the, the front of the Chronicle saying, blankety blank versus the world. So I decided that was really not a good career move to work with him. Um, and he was interesting and I really would like to do the book but the, I have no time for that at the moment. Maybe when I retire if I live to be 90. So um, he loved children, he taught children his entire career. Uh, the children he had, uh, I think, and this is really on the QT, I hope they're not lurking here or that you know the, the relatives, I think I know that the son changed his last name. Mm -hmm. Just a year or two ago while I was researching her again, I just wanted, I thought if I have to write a little biography, I want to be very careful not to step on a toe that might be litigious and various things. I was warned about that. Um, 
but I think his daughter finally changed her name, but only recently. So I, I could be wrong about that. It's, uh, so I've sort of dropped that little point of research. He did say to me right before he died, though, that he was very sad that he didn't know how many grandchildren he had. He made a complete break with the ex-wife and the two children and never reconnected with them. And he knew his son married young and had lots of children. So I thought that was kind of poignant that he finally, at the end of his life, he really said, I wish I knew how many grandchildren I had. So, all right. Uh, this was Robert in his prime before I knew him. Uh, the big smile that c came off pretty well, even squished, is just typically totally bubbly. Uh, I met him at church. He, I was doing a church gig, and in walks this little man with, he was very skinny, a little bit taller than I am, and wearing a plaid coat that was lavender green, pink, and blue stripes. It was very colorful, and I said, I need to know this guy. Well, uh, now this, you can't read all of this, but I'm calling this a reluctant acquisition uh, for several reasons. He didn't tell me he'd already had an association with Stetson. He had already started schmoozing with the piano professor at the time who had private students. And one of the professor's private students wanted to buy Robert Steinway. Robert, being careful with money, said, sure. Then the parent of the student said, oh, we need to pay you in installments. And Robert, ever careful with his money, said, no, I don't know you. This caused bad feeling right up front that I didn't know about for several years into this. And it was, it was really frustrating. It's just one of those things where the little personal politics can make such a difference, and it was very frustrating to hear. Fortunately, he gave the piano to Stetson. It's in the violin studio. Uh, but that kind of set immediately not a good relationship between the piano people and Right. And I kind of inherited that. Um, he, re he didn't reveal at this point that he had promised this collection to the International Piano Archive at the University of Maryland. When he approached me at church, I mentioned to him, I thought, oh my, this is enormous. He immediately described the scope of it, and I said, well, you know, we're just a little private school. We don't really have an extensive music library. We don't have a music archive we, this is really not where it goes. It really should go to one of these national centers, such as Maryland or Yale. Um, I knew him for quite a while before I knew he had, he had already promised this to IPAM in a letter of intent to Neil Ratliff, and I suppose you probably know Neil Ratliff, who, who passed away some years ago. Um, but it only went so far as being a letter of intent. Um, so the lawyers tell us that has no way, it's not to worry about that. Then he told me that he also had offered it to Yale, but that Vivian Pearl has turned it down. I have no documentation on that, and I found a couple of reference books uh, that we have since discarded in our library, um, where he actually put that in writing in a, a <coughs> reference or something. So that was a little little strange. The uh, well, you can't read that. Robert and the traveling tapes. Well, the, he started the interviews here with uh, Stokowski and Copeland and uh, Van Cliburn. Then he, um, he did other things. He had a, a radio show called The Pulse in Music. And I believe somebody told me there's a little grouplet of Boston music librarians who, I assumed it was smaller than this group, but maybe mm -hmm. not, uh, who sometimes meet. And they might have some recordings from these days. That would be very interesting to know about, at least to make a link to it at some point. Um, then he moved to uh, Maryland. He taught at Catholic University. He only did two stints as an academic, the 10 years at Boston Conservatory, and then later on about 14 years at Catholic University, where he did piano pedagogy. Um, in between, he taught private. So, so most of his career, in terms of years, really was private teaching. He traveled the country. Um, he went to Canada. He. Um, teaching workshops for piano students and when I met him I strangely enough I met him in 2007 and strangely enough I ran across because I'm a hoarder uh, a notebook from my college days going back many decades 
where I had a note, Piano Workshop with Robert Dunn. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't remember whether I'd met it. Mm -hmm. Now, I think it was a Saturday morning and I think I skipped it because <laughs> I would have remembered this guy, but that was kind of ironic. Okay, now, uh, since I can't show you the spreadsheet, um, I will tell you that there are all kinds of anomalies in the way he labeled things. He couldn't spell. And brilliant man, spoke French, spoke German, did, did interviews in multiple languages. Total recall of most things, but he couldn't spell. So that was an issue with, it's still an issue. There are a couple things still misspelled and you'll get a laugh out of when <coughs> catalogers take note. All right, we'll get to that. All right, um, this next one is um, Yuri Egorov, who uh, unfortunately died in the AIDS epidemic in the 80s, I believe. Um, he uh, had some family who decided to do a website honoring him, and I was contacted by a researcher. Uh, this is his letter asking for permission. Uh, well, yes, asking us for permission to use this tape. Uh, to put online. And so let's see if we can make this work. Uh, the computer is not connected to the web. Oh no. Okay. Never mind. We can skip it. I we'll go back. Is, is it not? I I, I was oh, busy right. getting the PowerPoint out and starting on how to connect to the Okay, now I've lost the Wi-Fi here. So now lost if, it if you want to give me a couple seconds I can have it up and running. Well do you want to wait? I mean, I'd like for you to hear a couple of these little tidbits. I've lost my PowerPoint. I have no idea where it went. Oh, there it is. Anyway, I can send you this if you want to listen to it. <laughs> All right, I'm sorry. You're going to get going. This is taking too long. Thank you. Um, all right. Now, this is something, um, perhaps I shouldn't mention this. It, you will probably recognize that name. She taught at Juilliard. And um, I found this in my house just a few days ago because he gave me all of his collection of his personal tapes, um, at his entire CD collection, all of his scores he intended to give us. He gave us boxes and boxes and boxes of stuff directly to me because he was, had been put in hospice. He knew he was on his way out. He said, I can't deal with this. Take it home. So I'm still stumbling over things that um, are of interest. And I, this was kind of, uh, I'll read it to you off my screen. I don't think you can see it. Um, he, lay, he said this was talk two with her, but the first had been unrecorded. So his, his numbering sometimes is a little odd too for an archive. Um, tape surreptitious. She didn't like a recorder. When I knew what richness of family and musical detail she freely would share, I knew I could not recall it all. Um, and her, uh, relationship to Rachmaninoff, et cetera. So I was a little embarrassed when I found that, but I thought, well, you know, what the heck? He was a hoarder. He was a, uh, a, a stalker of pianists in some, in some cases. <laughs> uh, he, he told a funny story about kind of stalking Lily Krauss at a, web, at a like festival out west, and he said they were staying in, in some motel, and he said he kept kind of looking around corners to get a look at her to see if he could maybe entice her for an interview, but he was not successful. And I wish I had a list of all the people he couldn't interview. <laughs> that would be so interesting because I don't think, even in his collection of letters that he gave us later, I, there's not much of that. And he never really fessed up to, to any of the disasters. Um, except that uh, Nicholas Leninsky called him the world's oldest sophomore. <laughs> I'm not sure if it's on the tape and I didn't have time to look for that. But being the Boston Connection, which I didn't realize, um, Okay, so anyway, he had the good sense to leave this out of the collection. 
but he really had a lot of bootleg things, and sometimes they would say, recorded with permission, they might be a master, a master class or a workshop, or even a, a recital. But I have no real proof of that, and I think that's pretty dicey, so that stuff is still at my house. I don't think it will ever migrate into the collection. Um, now this, oh good, you can see this. This is the hand of my student assistant, Mari, who was on Jeopardy last spring. She came in second, and we were hoping she'd win. She's a riot. And we were going through, I wish I'd taken a picture of the box. I have this in acid-free boxes, but he, all of these things were cassettes. He did not believe in sticky notes, even though they existed. So most of his notes are little pieces of chopped up, discarded paper. Some of them have music on the other side. Um, they're illegible by and large, even though he had the most beautiful handwriting until he was about 60. Um, and they were wrapped. He would take notes and programs and just things off the top of his head he'd jot down, wrap them all up in a rubber band and put them with a cassette. Well, you know what happens to rubber bands? Snap, snap. And after a while, it was just impossible trying to keep all of these hundreds and hundreds of cassettes with that stuff. So I finally said, to heck with this. We'll pull it all off, get rid of the rubber bands, see what trickles down. So I threw away a rather large box of completely illegible notes. We had no idea who they even went with. But there were some cases where you could actually tell uh, what they, and, and our new archivist, by the way, we don't have an archivist at Stetson. Uh, we didn't until January. Our archives is strictly Stetson-centric. So there were some issues in it, getting this um, collection. The, uh, the dean, the dean of music and my boss at the time uh, met him and they were very favorably impressed by him and what he had, the good things he had to say about Stetson. And I think he hinted at money coming later, which in a private institution, as you know, is huge. That's what our deans do is they raise funds. That didn't materialize, sadly. So I think they were holding out hope for that. But that's, that's part of how it, it came to, that's why I called it reluctant because I really felt like we were too, too small and out of the way to do it. But I'm grateful we have it because it's been really fascinating. Anyway, it, I had to laugh when I saw on this one, I think you can see it on the screen, where it has uh, Natasha Zaitsev. Of course, it's completely misspelled. Mm -hmm. uh, the correct spelling is S-A-I-T, I think Z-O-F-F. -F. But anyway, it, this was just so typical of stuff. There are phone numbers all over these things. And I thought, you know, someday I should just collect all those phone numbers and start calling. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows who would answer? Am I going to answer? This is another of what he called his topical scans, and he often, uh, I don't know if this is one, Evelyn swore out, no, he has that on tape. Uh, I don't know if that's in the transcribed ones, I doubt it. But he would often just sit down randomly and scribble out what he remembered of the tape. Um, one time I thought I should start uh, putting these things on a server when he gave us the transcriptions, because I wasn't quite sure how this worked. I got no support in the library. The technical person who was telling me what to do with this collection, you're going to love this. He said, oh, put these all up on iTunes University and throw away the cassettes. <laughs> even I, not being an archivist, not having thought about ramifications of copyright, even I thought, oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> so, no. So I was told to get, you know, not work with that guy. But um, this is kind of one little preservation thing that I think is kind of interesting, and our new archivist is very interested in this collection. I showed it to her, she's married to a musician uh, who's very interested in it, however, our dean has told her not to touch it because her duties all involve our local archives and things, and, and she feels like that's not gonna work out. Um, also, we don't have any finding aids in our archives. Our dean has not allowed that because we've never really had anyone being a full-time archivist uh, we've had students who wanted to do internships. She wouldn't let them do that because of the supervision stuff. I don't know. It's been a very strange thing. Um, this past summer, though, I had what turned out to be the equivalent of a, an intern who actually donated her own time for the entire summer. And she sat for, I saw her sit for as long as seven straight hours looking into these boxes and sorting things. And she had an incredible memory. She found things I didn't know were in there. She helped me rebox the whole collection into acid-free boxes. It, it, was, it was amazing. But she did this as a volunteer. You won't, I think, find too many people with the time to do that. She's going on to library school to become an archivist. 
which always makes us happy when that happens. Mm -hmm. So I, this has been a collection that has been in its enormous collection. It's got tentacles that seem to be everywhere. Um, and it's been, I've had no time to work on it, except for little bits, dribs and drabs. And my, my bosses look at me and roll their eyes any time I mention this collection, um, because they want me to be doing my job, which is not this. So um, you know, when I told them I was coming up here, my boss said, keep it short, and she rolled her eyes again. So. Anyway, he, he, when, when I decided to start scanning in, this was years and years ago, I decided to try scanning in some of these when I had time. I had to run over from the music building, find a scanner, you know, sign up, all that jazz. And as I went through one of them, I thought, this is very peculiar. So I got out the audio and realized that the first five or six pages of the type transcript didn't match the tape. So all I can figure is sometimes he decided to either rewrite or he just wrote from memory. His wife went with him a lot of the times. And I think uh, if there had been an equipment issue, sometimes it will say in the interview, sorry, uh, this, this previous part, uh, we lost the tape, we started again. There are all kinds of odd anomalies. So it was kind of comical to be listening to one thing and reading something different. It was the same gist, but it wasn't the same words. Now, Mr. Dunn was adamant that, uh, be sure to let me know if I need to stop, because I can talk for about three days on this. About uh, minutes? Okay, good, perfect. Um, Mr. Dunn was adamant, and you people who are into <coughs> archives or oral histories can tell me what you think of this. He was adamant that these things should be transcribed. Well, first of all, the audio needs to be preserved. Um, and second of all, he wants people to understand what the musicians sounded like, not just not not just the audio, but when they're transcribed, every er, ah, uh, um, and everything else. Um, and that's, I, my understanding is that's a thing. Not everybody does it that way. And I've looked at a couple of books of interviews with pianists, which are not at all done that way. They're, they look like someone giving a speech. You don't even see questions. He didn't like that. And um, I, I really liked his approach. Unfortunately, due to his tendency to purple prose and enthusiasm and bubbly, 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 he interrupted them all the time. <laughs> I took, it took me two weeks to do one of them one time for somebody, a researcher who had asked. We've had about five inquiries so far. Uh, the records are in OCLC. We've only five inquiries, which makes me a little sad. But this was someone doing research and wanted uh, to hear what this particular person had to say. So I said, okay, I don't have time to do the whole thing. I'll work through as much as I can. And it was the same kind of interrupting, interrupting. So you can't, you can't do it with a what, dragon, naturally speaking, or whatever that, I don't know what it's called now. It will adapt to your voice, but it won't take in the other voice. So that was impossible. And you have to keep stopping and starting and stopping and starting to get it right. And he, um, after I sent this to the researcher, and I, you know, I stole a couple of weeks from my employer doing it, he said, well, what was the point of that? And I felt really bad because I thought, have we accepted this, this useless piece of junk? Well, then I talked to some archivists about it. They said, hey, that's not your problem. Your problem is to preserve it, to make it available. And some of the interviews are great. They really are. Um, so that was just, he wasn't hearing what he wanted. He thought the questions were silly, maybe. I don't know. Uh, there's such a variety of people interviewed in here. Um, he interviewed competition winners, performers, pedagogues, uh, conductors, composers. Almost all had something to do with the piano, not all. Some uh, tuners. Um, he interviewed uh, uh, Henry Steinway. He interviewed uh, Robert Glazebrook, who ran Steinway in, in England. You know, he, he tried to keep up with a lot of different parts of the piano world. And I think his goal really was that this would be a repository of pianism in the last half of the 20th century, but the roots going all the way back into, you know, Beethoven and Liszt and Czerny and all those. And he was very conscious of lineages. So he asked questions always of, you know, who you studied with, what that was like. Uh, they talked about, he talked about specific techniques, you know, thumb under this, that, and the other. And he, he knew piano repertoire so well uh, that he could always get to very detailed comments. Um, my daughter uh, got her degree in French and she was volunteered by her mother 
to transcribe uh, the French interview. However, she got as far as uh, Vlado Karamuja, and pardon me if I'm not saying any of these names right, um, and she loved doing it. She, she, said, she said Robert's French was interesting. And <laughs> I can actually understand some of his French because he has such a heavy American accent. Uh, but she said, you know, he basically got the gist of things and, and she felt like it was, you know, she felt like it was a good interview and she'd heard me talk about this already for years. So that one is, is done. Uh, there are several others in French I would love for somebody to do. Okay, uh, on to the next one. This is just something we found wrapped around the cassette, and it turned out to be another one of those topical scans folded into a little tiny piece. So I kept that. Uh, when I talked to our archivist and I showed her all of this stuff, she just, she just shook her head. I think she's of a mind that I need to throw that box of stuff away, but so far I haven't been able to do it. Uh, this is uh, an interview with Lionel de Pachman, also called Leonid, who was the son of Vladimir de Pachman, who was a famous pianist in the early 20th century, probably late 19th century too. Uh, as I was reading through this, I, his notes, he mentioned that this gentleman was 92 when he was interviewed and he had a big booming voice. Um, I discovered later on when I was looking things up that he taught Boulez, which I thought it was in Boulez's interview that he popped up when I was searching his name in Google. All hail to Google. Uh, this one, I would love to have you hear a little bit of this, but this is, this is very interesting that um, he also collected people who asso were associated with other famous people. Um, Dolly is uh, also, uh, her name was Regine Helen, I think, uh, Bardock, and she then married uh, Gaston de Tina. And so, oh, and her name was listed two different ways in different parts of his collection. So it took me a very long time to figure out, what? I didn't know who she was. So, uh, and this interview is in French and she's charming and her English is also quite good. So I, I, I haven't had a chance to listen to that all the way through, but it is digitized. Um, this is uh, Yasha Zadie who uh, worked at QXR and was the first staff, I forget how it was phrased, he was the first staff music person, I think. And he did a, played a regular concert every week. He had a two piano team with uh, Lynn and Hambro, who's also interviewed in the collection. Um, and Robert interviewed him three times. And I wanted to show you a spreadsheet that I won't be able to, that where I went through, I just took names, dates, and um, went through them to highlight the multiples. Because he, he intended to interview people multiple times at certain career points. He was very interested in especially competition winners, not well, not necessarily winners, but competition participants. Um, and he did that to a degree, but that was very hard to pull off. Um, there were only a handful of them he interviewed as many as three times. I think uh, Paul Bedour Skoda was one, whom I got to meet and got to sit in on one of the interviews, the last one with him. Um, another category of folks that he collected were people who dealt with pianists and body work. Uh, this is Karen Shaw, who is a myotherapist who worked with Leon Fleischer when he had his injury. I think he was, I think she was one of the first people he worked with, with before he went to others. Uh, but this is Robert's studio in Virginia, in Winchester, and I love it because of his, that looks a lot like my, my library, office, home, etc. As you will see. Now, the problem with this, just apart from what's in it, the value of it or anything, was the size of it, the fact that there were so many moving parts, really, the fact that we really didn't have any place for it. Um, this went from the main library, their loading dock, I hauled it over to the music library, it uh, pulled it out to go into the stacks to work with it after hours as we sorted the tapes, went back, went back to my office in the same place, of course. Then we moved the entire music library in 2011. I was put into a cubicle, not even a door, no place for the collection, so it was stuck off in another room. Um, then I was moved to an office, then I was moved to another office, uh, and then the dean came by my office one day. It was night. It was banker boxes, nice and neatly stacked. And she said, "I don't like the way that looks. Get rid of it." Mm -hmm. huh. No. 
so I took it home, and then she came back later and thanked me for taking it home. Oh. I'll show you how that worked. Okay, now, this was my original office in the music building. That table wasn't in there. I had a desk and stuff. I had to cram all of this. There's probably 40 boxes of stuff mm -hmm. in there, right? This is, these were the stacks. This was the entire music library at Stetson. Um, and you can see the size of the piano gives you a little bit of a, a that was it. We had all of the records, all of the scores, all of the books, everything. No room for anything. So when I drug it home, it, my dining room has a card catalog I bought from the library when they got rid of theirs. And the little pink hearts have, um, Robert was very gay, and we had a lot of jokes about this. Uh, his, his apartment was full of nude male statues, so he, you know, he was very hey, you know. Uh, he was wonderful, fun to talk to. So I, in his honor, I put little pink hearts on, and I told him about that. Um, as I sorted through my copies of things, because he had the copy of the originals he gave us, which were cataloged, the working copies, which were in my office, then he had multiple copy three or his own copies plus a lot of stuff, bootlegs and all that. That all ended up at my house. Can I cut you off just in case we do have any questions? We are. Okay, uh, let me just whiz through. This is how it looked, this is how you should treat it. Um, catalogers, one thing here. This is uh, several of the, of the Boston interviews. And I had to fess up to this error. I didn't catalog them and I thought this was kind of funny when you all talked about cataloging the rules and procedures and how you adapt them. This was, uh, this was only uh, the second one. It says Robert Glassbrook. It's Glazebrook, very clearly Glazebrook, and I even knew of him. And it's misspelled in the, in the, in the uh, author statement. So that one I just saw. We just switched to WorldShare. Is anybody using WorldShare? <laughs> are, you, are you cringing? Are you? It, <laughs> okay, here's a warning. I loved it for cataloging, and we had to do it for monetary reasons. We didn't have a choice. Catalog is faster, but they left out a lot of the diacritics in World Share. <laughs> they don't have a hot check for Dvorak. They didn't have a little O over Martin News. I couldn't believe it. But that's another story. Anyway, uh, and I had to point out to OCLC and send them their own page off of their own website to say, by the way, where are the diacritics? And they had already owned up to some of them. They didn't even know. I, I'm, I'm appalled. So anyway, um, we can skip that. This is my, my working copy of the spreadsheet. Uh, coffee stains by Starbucks, et cetera. Uh, I have so many versions of the spreadsheet, but this is the main one, and it's huge. So I just printed out work from that to keep, keep up with what I've digitized and all that. So uh, oh, this is the one. Uh, Yes, this is where I established the dates. I decided to just pull it into a separate sheet. And then I put in, uh, it's where I put nationality and source of the name authority. I still haven't found everybody. And this is Robert late in life teaching in uh, Winchester and one of his piano students. And this is finally where it lives in archives. And you notice it has a plastic thing hanging down. We have a moisture problem, it's Florida. There is a dehumidifier right next to it that I insisted on. But if it doesn't get emptied every day, I go in there and it smells horrible. I, I cringe, but we have no, you know, that's something a donor's gonna have to give us down the road is a good space for archives. Um, that's it, that's me, goodbye.